Is pain always bad? Is suffering always evil? Is it fundamentally wrong to not be comfortable? If something hurts, should we always stop? Those seem to be the assumptions. As a culture, we value being comfortable above all else. What I think we're going to dare to talk about today is the idea that suffering is not always wrong, pain not always evil, to hurt is not the end of the world. I would like to suggest that sometimes suffering is part of being in a relationship, and sometimes suffering is not only not the bad thing, but is fundamentally necessary. Good. I found myself uh, pondering our allergy to suffering as I was reading what is known as the servant songs. That's what this is, a servant song of Isaiah, the suffering servant. Does that phrase ring a bell? Has anyone uh, heard any sermons on that? Does that come up in your studies ever, the suffering servant? This new territory for you all. Good. Looking at the suffering servant of Isaiah is the next step for us as we journey towards Easter. We have been in Leviticus these last three weeks, and we are done with Leviticus for now. Yippee! And uh, what, we have ha- what Leviticus has shown us is, is uh, that God shapes a community of people to live in a new way that is called clean, or, or we, what we would think of as normal. And having established normal, uh, God then describes the means by which people can get back to normal, can be restored to normal. Uh, they, God has laid out a series of sacrifices, such that peop- not so that people can be trained in a mechanical sense of, if I offend God this bad, I put 75 cents in, that gets me a Kit Kat, put, put $1.25, and that gets me the sun chips out of the, the candy machine. Right? That, that's not how, what is, is being described here. What we are, what's being described here is uh, this relational sacrificing, this relational way of, of thinking that uh, you, you let the other person know when so you have done wrong, uh, what would you like to have done? Olivia, if I do wrong by her, she would really like me to show up with flowers. And so you can think of, I say this tongue firmly in cheek, you can think of Leviticus as God's training in how the people should buy him flowers. Right? How, how does that work? How, you want to buy God flowers? It's, read Leviticus. That, tell, that shows us. Right? A, a few centuries down the road then, this prophet Isaiah, who's been raised in this system, uh, is inspired by God to show people how uh, God is at work in a particular time in, God, in, in Israel's national history and how the, the sacrificial system continues to form how God works. And, and the particular time in which the prophet Isaiah is speaking is, is the hardest time in all of the history of Israel. It, it's the exile. Right? This is the time it does not get any worse than this. And, and the first, the prophet Isaiah lays out why they have been sent into exile. And, and if you uh, want to read just some really depressing uh, if you're, you think you're in too good of a mood, you want to read something depressing, read the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, and it lays out how the people have failed. And it just pounds away. This is how you have failed. right? And, and this is why you're going into exile. And, and then in Isaiah 40, there is a shift, and, and the prophet looks to the future. Looks to the future and says, but God still loves you. God can still be trusted, and let's look down the road to, to what is coming. And the key to this future, to understanding how God is at work for your good for the future, are the servant songs. There are four or five of them, and we call them songs because in Hebrew, it's obvious poetry. Poetry doesn't translate well into English from other languages. It doesn't work very well, but it is, it is poetry. And so it gets at uh, how is God at work? God is at work through the the servant who suffers. We read this uh, servant song, it begins in 52.13, and we begin by seeing that the servant is raised up. Behold, my servant shall prosper, he shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Right? Before having a rough go, the, the servant is, is raised up as high as can be. But then having this rough go, having some things go very wrong, the servant is described as being marred was having a shocking appearance with no beauty or majesty that we would even look twice at him. Someone who is rejected being familiar with, with pain. Right? And so then the question that is asked is, who would have believed that the arm of the Lord has been revealed through this? And the arm of the Lord, uh, if you, whenever the Bible refers to a body part of God, it's not 
it's talking to some aspect of God, right? When it says that you are before God's face in, in Scripture, that's not saying you're literally before God's face. It's, say, it's saying you got God's attention, right? And you have God's full attention if you're before God's face. Uh, and, and so we're talking about the arm of God. What is an arm? What, what do you think will associate with arm, right? Strength. What is the power, the strength of God? Is this, and so the question that's being asked is, who would have believed that the strength of God, the arm of the Lord, would, would have been revealed by some, in someone who is so whooped looking, who, who is just so beat up? But the arm of God, it tells us, is going to be used for salvation and healing. The servant would be exalted again. Right? We, <clears throat> we read that uh, in the process of going through being... Uh, Whooped up, we read it's in 53, 4 to 5. Surely the servant has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. And so something about how this servant works uh, brings healing to those who follow until in the end, 53.12, Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great and sh he shall divide the spoil with the strong. This is talk it's like a feasting image, right? If, if you sit down to a feast, who gets the biggest portion? When you sit down to eat a meal, who gets the biggest portion? The guy at the head of the table, right? Th that's what it's saying here. He, th this servant will be exalted again. He's going to get the, the biggest piece of chicken when he sit down to have this meal. All right? So it will be exalted again. Who is the suffering servant? Right? Who is the one who is exalted and then marred and goes through suffering for the healing of others and then is exalted again? It's a trick question because you're all thinking Jesus. Right? And that's not the first answer that, that they would have thought. The first answer, from the point of view of the people who are reading this, I, the prophet Isaiah, he's saying this to the people uh, of Israel, they would think, ah, that's us. Right? Th think about from their point of view. They are the ones chosen by God, God's chosen people, exalted, right? They are the ones who are put, the, held up. We are God's chosen people. And then they are crushed and marred by the suffering of the entire nation as they go into exile. I mean, they just get whooped. The nation cannot get much lower than having its capital destroyed and having its people brought off into slavery. But by the arm of God, by God's power, they have been returned to their land. And it is only by God's power that such a thing could have happened because how often do you hear about that? Some people lose their land and then they get it back. Right? And they are exalted again. They have rebuilt the temple. They have refounded the nation. And yet, once again, they are exalted with all the other nations. They can stand tall. They have been made whole and complete. Right? It is about as clean and straightforward as can be that the suffering servant of the prophet Isaiah is Israel. That is true. And then, those who read uh, after the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus look at this and say, ah, it's true again. Right? It's true again. This is a passage that helps the church understand who Jesus is. When Philip, one of the early followers of Jesus, comes across an Ethiopian uh, court servant who is reading uh, this passage, and he asks, well, who is this? Philip jumps in the cart with him, it's in Acts 8, and says, let me help you understand this passage. And he explains and uses the suffering servant, this, this exaltation, and, and he uh, dies for the, uh, suffers for the healing of many, then exalted again, resurrection. Right? He uses that as a framework to explain to this Ethiopian fellow who Jesus is is. And, and then the Ethiopian fellow says, hey, there's some water. I should get baptized. And, and he does. Right? And so the suffering servant is Israel and the suffering servant is Jesus as well. If this is how God works with Israel, it's how God works through Jesus as well. It shows us something about how God makes things happen. God works in certain ways. And one of these ways is through suffering that's redemptive. Suffering that's worth it. Suffering that is powerful. Right? The reasoning of how this works, the suffering servant works, how by his bruises are we healed, just like with the sacrificial system, it's not a mechanical thing. It's a relational thing. It's best something better described with poetry than with algebra. Right? This is why Paul, when he's trying to explain it to the church at Philippi, he quotes music. He, he gives what's called the Christ hymn. And uh, in the same way, like if someone asked, what, tell me about grace. What's one of the best things you can say about grace? Amazing grace, 
How sweet the sound, right? You start singing Amazing Grace, and there's not anything more pure and true you can say about grace, and you just sing Amazing Grace together. That's poetry, right? It's music. It, it's, it, it gets at truths that are hard to explain if you try to sit down and logic it out. In the same way, uh, Paul writes uh, to the church at Philippi, he, he quotes the Christ hymn, which... Again, it's poetry doesn't translate well, but what he writes is, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, that exaltation, right, did not regard with equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, God exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the, at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. All right, so this sort of hymn gets at this, this sort of how this unfolds, exaltation and, and then humbled and service and, and suffering and then exaltation again. All right. So I want to end by just taking a moment to go back to that first question, that, that suffering, right? Is suffering always bad? Is suffering always evil and wrong to be avoided at all cost? And admitting that there are some types of suffering that are just from sheer idiocy. The first time I used a mandolin, right? You all know a cutting mandolin is a cutting device. I didn't use a safeguard. I've got a scar to prove it. I suffered. It hurt. We're not talking about that type of suffering. Sometimes we do something stupid and then we suffer for it. That's just us being stupid. It happens. I mean, and this isn't like going to the dentist. Who here likes going to the dentist, right? Anyone enjoy that? Nope. You go to the dentist and you suffer. It's not a good time. I'm talking about suffering for another. When have you suffered for another? When have you done something hard, challenging, uncomfortable, not because it was good for you, but because it was good for the other person? Anything come to mind? My sister-in-law. Yep. You can think of people, can't you? Right. Anyone else have someone come to mind that you suffered for? Fletcher, yeah, I got a kid to get up at 2 in the morning because that kid's screaming, that's suffering, I don't want to get out of bed, but I do it, right? Children are the easy example. Why do you suffer for people? Why do you do it? Because we love them. Because you love them, right? Because they're worthy of it. They're worth it. You wouldn't do it for any other reason. And, and there are times, I know at least this is true for me, maybe you are better people than I am. There are times I, 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 as I'm about to do something that's really going to hurt and do it for someone I, I love because they're worthy of it, I think, oh man, this is going to hurt. And then I do it anyways. Right? We do it because we love people and they are worthy of it. Today, as we talk about the suffering servant, this passage that first describes Israel and then is fulfilled in Jesus, there's much that we can get into. How is suffering service? When do we choose to serve? How, I mean, how do we even ha begin to handle that? Because you can serve, I mean, you, you can get in some deep waters with this, and we'll, we'll get into them next Sunday. But what it strikes me, what is the most important and first thing to hear about the, from this passage is what is the most obvious. Jesus suffered for you. Jesus suffered for you that you might be forgiven. On the cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. That's when your salvation begins, when Jesus says, Father, forgive you. That's when you begin to be made whole. And Jesus did it because he loves you and because you're worth it. Did it for you. Thanks be to God. Amen. We come to a time when we confess when we have fallen short of how, what God calls us to be. Please join with me as we pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray.